Good evening, everybody. Hello. Good evening. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Um, I'm Aaron Glass, a faculty member here at the Bard Graduate Center. Uh, I'd like to welcome both our regulars and our visitors, both in the room and um, watching us remotely online, um, to this year's first installment in the Mr. and Mrs. Raymond J. Horowitz Seminar on New York and American Material Culture. Um, and our next speaker in the series, Dana Bird, uh, will be here on January 30th. Um, you can see on the sign just outside the door. Um, for, those, for those joining us remotely, or for those in the room who are too shy to raise your hands, um, you are invited to participate in our Q&A afterwards by tweeting your questions to hashtag BardGradCenterTV, um, which for those of you watching online will be on your computer screen. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Lenny Lenape people on whose ancestral territories we are gathered here tonight. I'm extremely pleased and honored to welcome Paul Chot Smith, an accomplished scholar, author, curator, and essayist. A member of the Comanche Nation, Smith joined the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in 2001, where he co-developed the inaugural History Gallery and currently serves as associate curator. At NMAI, he organized the solo exhibitions Fritz Shoulder, Indian, Not Indian, and Brian Jungen, Strange Comfort. And with Truman Lowe, he curated James Luna's performance Emendatio at the 2005 Venice Biennale. Smith's television appearances include 1995 Canadian series Markings, and he served as a creative consultant for the 2009 PBS series We Shall Remain, A Native History of America. An enemy of essentialisms, he limbs the poorest borderlands of historical and contemporary Native American experience, challenging stereotypes, cliches, and presuppositions. Well known as a writer of incisive wit and penetrating analysis, Smith has authored two standard texts in American history and American Indian studies. Like a Hurricane, the Indian Movement from Alcatraz to Wounded Knee, written with Robert Warrior in 1996, and Everything You Know About Indians is Wrong, published in 2009. His essays challenge readers, both native and non, to reconsider iconic images, familiar episodes, and political bromides. Among my favorite titles, Delta 150, an essay about airplanes, genocide, and rainbows. The terrible nearness of distant places, his critical reflection on helping to produce NMAI's core installations in Washington. 20th Century Fox, the afterword he kindly provided to my own edited volume on photographer Edward Curtis, and Stop Listening to Our Ancestors, an interrogation of what he calls the Indian Museum Anthropology Industrial Complex. <laughs> For the past couple of years, from deep within this complex, Smith has been involved in developing an ambitious and provocative exhibition for the National Museum of the American Indian on the foundational role of indigenous imagery and nomenclature in American history, culture, politics, and identity. He has come here tonight to tell us about the making of Americans. Please join me in welcoming Paul Chot Smith. So Aaron, the Carmelo Anthony trade, what do you think? Are you for it or against it? How many wins for the Knicks next year? Time will tell, I guess, huh? Yeah, so anyway, last night I just said, screw it with the images. I've been giving these talks, and I've been carefully curating images, which I'm always fighting, because who needs images, really? You know, so I just you have my sentences. But now, like, everybody's been looking at me the whole time instead of the cheetah cubs that I put up there and the TV test pattern. So I'm second guessing myself. Can everybody hear me okay? No, louder. Hello, testing, one, two, three. How about on the interwebs? Can you hear me? Do I have to yell like this the whole time or what? I do? Okay. All right. Enough of Carmelo Anthony. For uh, pretty much the entirety of this decade, my life has been consumed with one project. When publishers came calling asking if I had another book in me, I told them, no, not right now. I basically checked out of the art world. 
I don't think it's a good thing when a project takes this long. Most of my exhibitions have been two years start to finish. I get bored easily, and not many projects stay interesting once you start observing their anniversaries. So here's a quick synopsis of the show that covers the basics. Americans, the exhibition explores a paradox at the heart of 21st century American life. Indians are nearly invisible in the United States, absent from the great national debates of our time, even a fleeting presence in American history. There are no A-list Native American celebrities, no powerful Sioux or Cheyenne politicians dominating headlines and making deals in Washington, no hit TV shows featuring Native topics. Yet representations of Indian culture and history are ubiquitous. These representations, fanciful, cartoonish, well-meaning, insulting, are everywhere. Dream catchers, sports team mascots, weapon systems, cars, fashion, advertising, they wallpaper contemporary American life, so common and so unremarkable that, like wallpaper itself, they require no explanation or discussion. They simply exist all around us. Most of our visitors know these imaginary Indians quite well. Americans who would admit to knowing little about Native history might be driving a Jeep Cherokee or flying an Apache helicopter. They might live in Indian-named towns like Chicago or Miami or Tuscaloosa and remember Squanto and Pocahontas and Sitting Bull from school. Why? How can Indians be absent and present everywhere and nowhere? notable and irrelevant. The exhibition has an answer to that question. We propose that Indian imagery is embedded in American life because the United States and American Indians are deeply entangled in history, national consciousness, and contemporary experience. As visitors exit the museum, they will start to see the representations of imaginary Native Americans all around them as evidence and reminders of the epic story that is American history, a nation shaped at great cost uh, to Native people from the very beginning. So that's how we describe the show. And um, it opens in four months. And that's three months later than we announced publicly. This is a very rare thing for NMAI. We aren't necessarily that good exhibits but we've never blown a deadline before. Uh, I've been there since 2001. It's never happened. Um, it's an expensive and ambitious effort, and this evening I'm going to offer a kind of preview of the show. Uh, as I say, I've decided not to use images because screw images. Um, an exhibition is such an odd thing, and even though we have pretty renderings of it, I would rather leave some mystery to what it's gonna be like. And also because my designers are here, uh, they're dressed in black in the second row over there. <laughs> and they spend a great deal of time and effort and money to make sure this exhibition looks like no Smithsonian exhibition ever. So I want to keep some suspense about that. Um, and I've decided to embrace the graduate piece of the Bard Graduate Center and take this opportunity to look at some of the hardest decisions the curatorial team has had to make. These are storylines you can follow if the exhibition gets the kind of attention we very much hope it does. And some of those stories aren't necessarily good for us. The truth is, lots of people are going to be unhappy with this show. I hope not too many, and I obviously expect vastly more will find it engaging and provocative, powerful, and even fun. As one example, at this very moment, sofas are being constructed in Germany that will be in the centerpiece of the largest intact space in any exhibit we've had at the museum since we opened in 2004. This exhibit is actually going to welcome you and invite you to sit down in plush, I think it's made at a Mercedes-Benz factory or something, I'm not sure, but anyway. We want people, I want people to have a really good time. Um, and yet still make it provocative. Um, I think it's by far the smartest thing I've ever done, and I think it's gonna create waves of both praise and dissent. 
So I'll get to some of those um, provocations and the uh, pushback against them in a bit. But let me start with the name of the show because it explains a lot. First of all, the title is Americans. Not the Americans, just Americans. Remember that scene in The Social Network where the sleazy tech mogul convinces Zuckerberg to rename the Facebook to Facebook? Cleaner. Like that. So Americans, one word. Now, truth be told, it was a working title. As veterans of these things will recognize, most of the time you never come up with anything better than the working title, so you better hope it's good. But I always thought we'd add some windy subtitle because there's a rule somewhere that says all self-important exhibitions must have a windy subtitle. <laughs> we tried, but we never came up with one. And then we remembered the 2007 film Spider-Man 3. <laughs> Specifically, we, rem we remember the Spider-Man 3 was the full and complete title of the movie. No subtitle. We thought, hey, we can do that too. <laughs> so we did. Now, full disclosure, we brief, briefly considered one alternative uh, subtitle uh, meant to reach a younger demographic, and that was going to be Americans. That's right, bitches, no subtitle. <laughs> but then I thought, who cares about the younger demographic anyway? So we kept it to Americans. But here's where it really came from. Years ago, I was reading Daniel Richter's Facing East from Indian Country and was intrigued by a passage that said, in the centuries before the US won independence from England, the most common term Europeans used to describe the indigenous was Americans. I had never heard that. I thought, well, you know, it kind of makes sense, but I didn't know this. So Richter's story checked out. It turns out the very first uh, uh, definition in the 2017 Oxford English Dictionary, A1, says Americans means indigenous inhabitants of the Americas. And they explained it now, qualifying it as American Indian, but for centuries there wasn't a qualifier. Americans meant people who were already here. They also, being the OED, had these wonderful citations from the 16th and 17th centuries of examples of how this was used. Quote, the Americans believe all creatures have souls. Or quote, amazing accounts are given of the persevering speed of the Americans. So think about it for a minute. For centuries, when Europeans talked about us, they called us Americans. Not Native Americans, not Indians, not First Americans, just Americans. Back then, I was also listening heavily to Exile on Main Street, and I always loved that title as a perfect description of Indians in the United States. That we once lived in the main street of the world, and now we're pushed to the Hoovervilles on the edge of town, across the railroad tracks, past the power stations. How did this happen? How did this become that? That question became a, a framing question we revisited many times in constructing the exhibition. So the title is at once a statement, a question, and a narrative. It also embodies a new direction and a new optimism charted by Kevin Gover, my boss at the National Museum of the American Indian. This new direction sees a museum becoming a truly national museum about American Indians and the American experience, rather than an ethnic museum narrowly focused on a certain definition of culture. We are proud of the exhibitions we opened with in 2004. We also acknowledge many visitors were baffled by those shows, which they saw as both dense and repetitive. We recognize the exhibitions didn't really ask much of our visitors and gave them permission to be cultural tourists as if there was no real connection between visitors and the communities portrayed in the exhibits, or even further between the communities and other communities portrayed in the exhibits. They were atomized portrayals um, of a certain idea of culture. Moving forward, Kevin Gover made clear we must build compelling exhibitions that fully embrace the fact <coughs> that overwhelmingly our visitors are not Indians. They are Americans who know little about Indians but want to know more. 
They are looking for connection and relevance to their own lives. They also understand much of what they've learned is inaccurate or just plain wrong. Now, here's the thing about our public. The vast majority will spend just 15 minutes in a, in a single gallery at NMAI. They also, I must report, are often cranky and have made very poor fashion choices. <laughs> so my task as a curator is radically different than my college professor friends who have seminars and big sticks in the form of grades and expensive tuition to induce their students to learn the material. I have nothing like that. But what I do have is a million people who enter my building every year. The Smithsonian Museum is like Madison Square Garden. The show better be ambitious and entertaining or you're dead. With every exhibition, with every text, I'm working as hard as I can, as hard as I possibly can to rock your world. I want to get in your head. I want you thinking about my words and ideas three days later. I detest being ignored. Success for Americans means building an experience that my cranky public will find engaging and memorable. Even, or perhaps I should say especially, the ones wearing those bright red baseball caps with patriotic slogans. Big exhibitions need a big idea. And in Americans, it's what we've named Indians Everywhere. In 2017, in this country of 320 million Indians, or perhaps 1% of the population, about the same as the number of Asian Indians, Indian Americans. In the Twin Cities, the Southwest, upstate New York, a few other places, Indians are present and not invisible. But for most, we are abstractions. And yet Americans are deeply familiar and emotionally connected with Indian imagery and place names. This opened up the paradox that most Americans know very little about Indians, yet from their earliest memories, Indians are part of their lives and never go away. It's just that these aren't actual Indians, but the idea of Indians manifested in advertising, place names, cars, weapons, and sports teams. The deeper we explored this, the more we found. And eventually, this became the rocket fuel that powers the entire exhibition. Well, OK, you already know all this. You already know that states have Indian names. You already know feathered hats are on baking powder. And you already know mascot controversy. And yet, I'm here to tell you that there's nothing like Indians everywhere. There is no equivalent in all the world. People say, what about the Notre Dame Irish or the Dallas Cowboys? I laugh and say, let's count. There's been thousands of teams with Indian names. And then I say, hey, look, I'll give you all the sports teams. Let's call it even. Show me an ethnic group that's been the face of airlines and insurance companies and brake fluid and whiskey and cigarettes and software and hotels, motorcycles, surface-to-air missiles, luxury sports cars, attack helicopters, bottled water, atomic bomb tests, baking powder, fruit boxes, and a third of the states and streets in every town and city in the country. Show me that, and then we'll talk. There really is nothing like this anywhere else. It turns out the most American thing ever is, in fact, American Indians. How crazy is that? So what is this all really about? American sees Indians everywhere as profound visual evidence that acknowledges there is no United States without American Indians and an empathic, subconscious, deeply weird determination that Americans want to always remember this, no matter what. So we are building an experience visitors will see for the first time what has been around them their entire lives, normalized as we call it in a cultural critic trade, and attempt to move past the shiny distractions of stereotype and cultural appropriation to see the bigger and more profound picture. I think the most radical thing about the project is our insistence on treating visitors with respect and even affection. I so much want people to have a good time. 
I don't want people to feel guilty. People have been feeling guilty about Indians for centuries. Where has that gotten us? When has that ever advanced Indian interests? I've written about Indian imagery and romanticism since the 1990s, and what's always fascinated me was how the phenomenon was never just one thing, but a shapeshifter. It's always felt reductionist to call it stereotyp stereotypes or racist. It's so much more than that. So we began seeing the opportunity to surround visitors with the Indians they've known all their lives, these familiar comforting presences, as a way into a more profound engagement. The goal is to create a situation where visitors feel empowered to assess our arguments and decide for themselves. We're saying this isn't just kitsch or stereotype or one big racist joke. We're saying, in fact, these images have tremendous power. And if you look closer, they can be decoded to reveal deeper meanings. It's felt way better than dumping massive amounts of information on them. Visitors don't seek information. If they were, information has never been easier or cheaper to obtain than it is now. What visitors want is experience and meaning. They want to learn more about a topic they know something about and are interested in. They want to feel affirmed and they want to feel smart. And most of all, they want to understand how it relates to their lives. This isn't what they say if you ask them. This is what I know from 30 years as a curator. There's something else that's weird and striking and very special about Indians everywhere, especially at our present national moment, when it feels like the country hasn't been this divided since 1861. It's remarkable to see how this phenomenon crosses every demographic, every taste, every region, every political viewpoint. We illustrate this by showing two uh, tour t-shirts, one from Leonard Skinner, one from Kanye West, with a nearly identical Indian feathered death skull. As you probably know, exhibitions like this take a small village, and I want to acknowledge my partner in this enterprise, the spectacular curator and scholar, Manhattan's own Cecile Argentome. Uh, University of Minnesota Press is publishing her companion book to the show. It'll be out in a few weeks, and you'll be seeing lots of her once we begin rolling out Americans in the next few months. Um, and I want to point out that even though I'm the lead curator, she's um, equally responsible for all the mistakes uh, in the show. <laughs> so there's a famous line dissing rock critics that says, writing about music is like dancing to architecture. And that's how I feel in trying to describe the three-dimensional experience of a museum exhibition. I think it was Lou Reed, really annoyed at uh, Robert Criscow in the Village Voice, who came up with that. I'm not sure. It's apocryphal. But, um, to give you an idea of um, how disarming uh, we've designed the show to be, uh, when you come in this show on Americans, here are some of the people you're going to see in our central gallery, 100 feet by 30 feet. Some of the people in the show are Albert Einstein, Elvis Presley, FDR, Carly Kloss, Ted Turner, Robert Griffin III, Jimmy Hoffa, Chaka Khan, Michelle Obama, Tim McGraw, Boris Karloff, Harry Belafonte, and of course, Cher. <laughs> I'm fully expecting they'll come to life after closing each night. Imagine the parties. So, um, back to all the trouble we're going to get into. It all sounds so positive, all that stuff I'm saying. The exhibition is in significant ways running counter to the zeitgeist. And as a cultural critic who's, who is legally empowered to use pretentious words like zeitgeist as often as he damn well pleases, <laughs> trust me, I understand very well the risks involved. We much prefer to be surfing the zeitgeist, ahead of everybody else, but not too far ahead. That's the whole game right there. You want to be riding the zeitgeist, not crashing into the thing. So the first big wave we are crashing into is about the imagery of Indians everywhere. At the very moment, the Indian project of teaching the intelligentsia of blue state America that mascots are wrong, dressing up as Indians is wrong, Thanksgiving is wrong, Western movies are wrong, products and place names, wrong, wrong, wrong. Here comes Americans, which says, you know what, we kind of like all that imagery. Some of it's racist and stupid, get rid of it. But most of it isn't. Most of it is actually kind of interesting. And there's way more to it than it's been given credit for. 
Indians everywhere, we say, is, is massive power hiding in plain sight. So keep in mind that many activists, many of them friends of mine, consider this imagery hate speech. I know from, well, life, few of them will reverse years of commitment to their view of Indian imagery to entertain ours. Lots of those folks will be deeply unhappy. The second big wave we're crashing into is called history. We could have done a fine show about Indians everywhere, which some would hate sure enough, but there's lots to say on this one subject. Instead, we decided to propose that the reason Indians are everywhere is because Indians are embedded in American history, culture, and national identity. Now, I want to tell you something about history. History is not your friend. History is not nice. History is a wild-eyed, mangy dog, starving and furious, pacing between you and the front door to your house. Your house, in this instance, is, a warm, is warm and glowing and contains the story of how Indian nations fighting removal align with abolitionists fighting slavery. This house is partly inspired by Walter Johnson, who wrote a stunning book called River of Dark Dreams that the curatorial team fell in love with that described the incredible wealth of the Cotton Kingdom and how the removal of Indian nations was at the center of that explosion of wealth that uh, created fortunes in New England, um, in, in the UK, around the world. We love this story. We had to have it. Now, even before the mangy dog showed up, you know there's some problems. The main one being that the five civilized tribes owned slaves. But you thought you could manage this. There are basically three options that have been used over the years. The first is my favorite because it was the one I learned way back in the 1970s. This is what we call the never happened version. It says actually there were no Indians who owned slaves. There were white men who owned slaves living in Cherokee or Choctaw country, but they weren't Indians. And also we said, well, maybe sometimes we did own black people. That was just to protect them from slave hunters. God, I miss the 1970s. We also said white people invented scalping, I think. We never scalped once. The white people invented it and did it, and that's what we said. Um, meanwhile, black scholars said with straight faces that Egyptians invented the airplane and spoke of ice people and fire people. Yeah, I miss the 70s. <laughs> the second version I call the Samsonite scenario. This one is widely used today. You'll see it in different exhibitions. There's a shift to something like a dial tone uh, in, the, in the exhibition text to signal that what you're about to read isn't very interesting or important. Kind of like an end user agreement for software. Don't pay it any mind. And um, the information is delivered in a boring, non-committal way. And the information is, yes, Cherokee's own slaves. And actually, when the Cherokee were removed, they brought the slaves, slaves with them to Oklahoma. So nothing to see here, no big deal, just kind of a fact that's out there. And don't pay any mind. And this was working quite well until actual scholarship over the past decade made it indelibly clear that slavery was a core principle of the five civilized tribes. They had a long history with slavery. It helped them build their nations in the South. And they also used owning black human beings uh, to rebuild in the West. You learn in um, school about, you know, bloody Kansas and which states were free or not. Removal actually made expanded slavery into a completely new territory. Uh, the five civilized tribes developed, uh, put down, crushed, slaved, Help them rebuild in the West. The snarling dog is his third option. It's telling you about the slave rebellions in Indian Territory, the black codes tribes developed, the explicit racialization of skin color, the legal protection of slavery in constitutions, and the clear statement of principles the five civilized tribes made to explain why they aligned with the Confederacy. They fought to preserve slavery in their nations. They fought very hard until the very end, until the last battle of the Civil War. They freed their black slaves only under federal compulsion in 1866, and many have resisted making what are called the freedmen citizens of their nations, even in 2017. So 
as you look at those things, it just becomes clear that the Cherokee, Seminole, and others were both victims and oppressors. And that on this issue that's exploding in national consciousness now, some of these Indian nations continue to be on the wrong side of history. This is really bad for the narrative I want to tell. This is completely unwelcome in every possible way. So I hate that dog that's giving this news. I want the glowing house where maybe only a few Indians kind of sort of own slaves. I want that grand alliance of abolitionists and Indians, which never happened. I want the Indians to be noble victims, I guess, even though I don't think I do, pure of heart, not actual human beings trying to get rich the best way available for them to, in the mid-19th century. And this is just one example. The exhibition has 99 problems, and that snarling dog, I can assure you, is definitely one of them. <laughs> so we should have, in retrospect, ditched history for historical fairy tales, but we didn't.